it's wonderful to be here in Copenhagen, especially, uh, I especially want to thank my good friend, uh, former Prime Minister Rasmussen, for inviting me to speak today uh, uh, on a topic uh, close to my heart and critical to, uh, I believe, our shared future. Some months ago, I received a letter from Andres that, uh, that he had an idea. He said that he had written, he had uh, read an article that my colleague and I, Mike Carpenter, had written in Foreign Affairs. The article uh, discussed the Kremlin's all-out, what I believe it's all-out assault on the institutions of the West in their effort to erode the very underpinnings of liberal democracy, including uh, in meddling in our electoral processes. And Andres wanted to organize a commission, he said, that could uh, keep this threat uh, one whose members crossed continents and spanned ideological spectrums politically, but who were all united in a passion of belief in democracy. And I, and I thought it was an outstanding idea. We spoke about it a few times on the telephone at the Munich Security Conference uh, earlier this year. And yesterday, uh, as you know, we held the first meeting of a newly organized Transatlantic Commission on Electoral Integrity. And uh, it was a gathering of leaders with a broad cross-section of expertise, including many former heads of state, some of whom you've heard from today. And most of us, uh, know, though, don't no longer hold uh, formal political office. But all of us share the same title, what my friend uh, Barack Obama calls the most important office of any democracy, in any democracy, citizen. We're all citizens because democracy requires vigilant and constant tending. As citizens, it's, in my view, our solemn responsibility to question and to scrutinize. As citizens, our duty to defend de democratic values and freedoms. And today, unfortunately, the vital work of citizens to engage in their democracies, I would argue, is more important uh, than ever all over the world, not just in Europe and the United States. Because, as was discussed a little bit earlier, the threat to democracy isn't confined uh, just to Russia. Authoritarianism is on the rise uh, in every region in the world. Repressive regimes from China to Iran to Venezuela are weakening democratic forces in their societies and strengthening their grip on power. These same governments uh, are also increasingly projecting authoritarian influence beyond, beyond their borders through uh, cutouts and proxies, energy manipulation, uh, propagandizing to advance the liberal goals uh, everywhere, increasing uh, their own relative power. At the same time, in established democracies, uh, including my own country, we are seeing appeals to populism, nationalism, and xenophobia weaken democratic norms and institutions from within. I might note parenthetically, but for 72,000 votes, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, and that's important, I think, to keep in mind when we talk about this fundamental change that's taken place in the United States that I hear so much the last couple of days. In some ways, it's understandable. There are a lot of folks in, in my country and in developed nations around the world that are worried that politicians aren't looking out for them or their children's future. In this age of interconnection, borders seem less real. Terrorist attacks feel inescapable. Fears about unrelenting migration mount as people continue to flee violence and deprivation in their homelands. And uh, some are worried that uh, the demographic and cultural foundations of their society are going to be forever changed, if not erased. And uh, add to that the growing sense of economic dislocation. Globalization has not been an unalloyed good. It has deepened the rift between those racing ahead at the top and those struggling to hang on to the middle or falling to the bottom. Technology has divorced productivity from labor, meaning we're making more than ever, but with fewer workers. Low-skilled laborers are less in demand, while highly educated workers are being paid more than ever, contributing to a rising inequity, which you're sensing and feeling the anxiety about in every one of our countries. International trade and greater economic integration has lifted millions of people in the developing world out of abject poverty. But in many communities in the developed world that have long depended on manufacturing, there's a feeling of being shut out from those opportunities. When people see the system dominated by elites and rigged in favor of the powerful, they are much less likely to trust that democracy can deliver and address their problems. 
and in ways that evoke echoes of the 1930s, frustrated and disaffected voters may turn instead to strongmen. Demagogues and charlatans step up to stroke people's legitimate fears and push the blame always on the other. There always has to be a scapegoat. Now it's immigrants, outsiders, the others. This is a storyline we have seen before. It's nothing new. Rather than some dramatic assault on democracy, however, the push or the coup, our institutions of freedom are slowly but determinedly being sanded down, just little by little. Each small step designed to curb institutional safeguards and concentrate power in the hands of individual leaders. In Poland, the ruling party portrays checks and balances as impediments, impediments to achieving key national goals and then uses that pretext to stack the courts with political appointees. Hungary's leaders blame nefarious outside influences on the ills of Hungary's society while holding up illiber illiberal democracy as a model that best represents the interest of the common people in Hungary. The Romanian government portrays anti-corruption institutions as impediments to effective governments and argues the need to dismantle them to allow them to become more effective. And all around the world, repressive governments are borrowing from one another's playbook, deriding a critical free press as fake news, questioning and delegitimizing independent judiciaries in each and every one of these countries, hamstringing civil society with increasingly restrictive and repressive laws as we saw with Russia's so-called foreign agent law, which labels any civil society group that receives foreign funding a spy. And they're dangerous impulses. These are all dangerous impulses for individual democracies. But taken together, these trend lines threaten to erode democratic ideals and institutions that have been the foundation for, uh, for the Western world. And that's exactly what authoritarian leaders want and are about. I've been very direct about what I think the Kremlin is doing. I've been very direct in my personal conversations with Mr. Putin about what I believe his objective is. Kremlin wants to weaken democratic institutions, divide Europe and its core institutions of NATO and the EU, and delegitimize rule-based international order. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? Again, those of you who hold office or held office in your respective countries, how'd you like to have to try to put Russia together? It's a kleptocracy funded by petrodollars that is divided, shrinking. It's got what we say in my old neighborhood, the boy's got some real problems. But that's how Putin believes he can maintain, I believe, his grip on power. He's more than happy to use our greatest strength, an open and vibrant society, to use it against us. Using the internet and social media to spread disinformation and exacerbate internal divisions. Exploiting our financial institutions to launder money and export corruption hacking our communications networks to steal information. That's why the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity is so critical. Our goal is not to relitigate past intrusions, but to expose the ongoing threats to our institutions, especially our free and fair elections, and to frustrate future efforts to exploit and manipulate our open societies. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard famously wrote, Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Every day, we understand more and more the depth and sophistication of Russia's assault on elections in the United States in 2016. In hindsight, we learn about other places around the world where illiberal powers have sought to manipulate and undercut democratic institutions. Now, it seems to me we need to apply that understanding forward. 
It's not enough to know what happened in the past. We have to anticipate, anticipate, and counter the next evolution of these tactics. With so many elections occurring across Europe and North America in the coming months, Russia and other malign actors have a target-rich environment. We have, uh, we have the, a much harder job to educate voters in these countries to understand how influence is being bought and sold to preserve the character of our open, vibrant, and uh, innovative societies while preventing interference by a few bad actors. So one of the questions we have to face is, how, how can we do this? In the case of foreign interference, establishing a greater transparency is the first and most important step. If we can expose foreign meddling in real time, we can blunt its successes. We've taken some small steps in the United States toward this end, the Honest Ads Act, but both government and social media companies need to do a lot more to, to expose disinformation and root out fake accounts, keep the public informed about how foreign governments are trying to game the system. We have to protect our networks and impose costs when we find Kremlin proxies penetrating our electoral infrastructure. We have to improve transparency of our financial and real estate markets to crack down on opaque or illicit foreign financial flows of investments in the billions of dollars. Recently, investigative journalists discovered more than $20 billion in Russian money laundered through just a couple of banks in the Baltic states and in Moldova, almost all of it from Western financial institutions, including Deutsche Bank right here in Denmark. Corrupt money almost certainly finds its way into our campaign finance system. We'd be foolish to believe otherwise. And corrupt money is the preferred tool of authoritarian regimes to undercut democratic governance across the, the board in every country, especially in fledgling democracies that lack robust institutions to defend that in order to defend the rule of law. That's why we have to stand with those nations that are on the on the, on the front lines of freedom, newly, demo, newly uh, democratic states like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. In the West, it's all too easy to lament the shortcomings of these countries, as if uh, fighting to regain one's sovereignty while adopting democratic reforms is easy or ever has been easy. They need help and they need support. And if we're serious about our commitment to advancing democratic values, we owe it to them and to ourselves to put more skin in the game, in my view. I think the current U.S. administration made a right decision in sending Javelin missiles to support Ukraine, but Javelins neither win the war nor help Ukraine become a democracy. So much more is needed. Political support for anti-corrupt institutions, financing financial support for energy reforms, technical support for customs and tax reform, and an unrelenting message from every other democracy in the world that they have to deal with their internal corruption, which has been endemic. Those of us who champion democracy have to lead the change. We have to help these countries strengthen their young democracies against internal and external threats that they do more than survive. They have a potential to strive over, to thrive over time. If democracy takes root in Ukraine or Georgia or Moldova, Think what a powerful inspiration that would be to Russian citizens living under Putin's aggressive regime. At least he thinks about that. We also must battle the misguided perception that Western democracies may no longer offer the best path to geopolitical success. The rise of China and the success of a handful of authoritarian capitalist states are contributing to the narrative that authoritarian model is more competitive than democracy in a globalized and increasing automated economy. Like I said, think of the problems that they have. Just think what it would take, all with a government underpinned by princelings where corruption is endemic and it cannot be sustained. But there's overwhelming evidence that illiberal democracies that protect uh, 
that protect individual rights almost always, liberal democracies that protect individual rights almost always outcompete authoritarian states in the long run. Spikes in oil prices and export-led industrialization can deliver impressive economic growth for a time. But no one should harbor the illusion that Putin's Russia or the People's Republic of China or any self-styled illiberal democracy will deliver sustainable results. Neither should we forget that one of our greatest sources of strength, one of the critical reasons for our historic geopolitical success, is the unprecedented, unprecedented system of alliances that the United States and Europe and our European allies put together after World War II. Think about it. Everything we built was designed to make it harder to abuse power across the board. Everything we designed. These alliances anchored in our shared democratic values are how we address every major global challenge and successively deter aggression. Authoritarian nations may temporarily coerce nations to their side through force or fear, but compelled relationships are never as reliable, resilient, or effective as voluntary partnerships. We have to keep strengthening our alliances and resist those who would undermine our solidarity. Because without this basis of shared democratic values holding together a rule-based international order we work so hard to build, we will surely see illiberal actors rush to fill the global power vacuum, overriding rules we designed to protect opportunity for many with rules that unfairly advantage the select few. In my view, we have to double down on what we know works, what has developed growth and expanding prosperity to, democ to democratic nations for generations. Inclusive institutions, the rule of law, equal protection, and equal opportunity for everyone. That's what makes open democratic societies the most prosperous, resilient, and strongest states in the world. We democracies, the United States included, may not always live up to our highest values. We have to keep striving toward a more just and more open future. I'm often criticized for saying it's not the example of the United States' power, but the power of the United States' example that has allowed us to help organize the democracies of the world. And finally, we have to loudly and unwaveringly defend our shared values. The vast majority of Americans, and I suspect many Europeans as well, continue to believe that freedom and democracy are vital to our future. There's a new Penn from the University of Pennsylvania, Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement work just completed. We just completed an original survey, a research project with Freedom House and the George W. Bush Institute to better understand how Americans feel about their democracy today. The full results will be out next week, but I can tell you, while it's clear that a majority of Americans are deeply worried about our democratic principles and institutions, how they're being eroded, they are overwhelmingly not prepared to give up on them. This work has to start at home for all our countries. That's why the European Union's new budget proposal to withhold assistance based on compliance with democratic principles is smart timely and important, if you don't mind someone from across the pond giving an opinion. We have to recommit ourselves to the unending work of living up to our values, even when it's really hard. Treating everyone with dignity, without exception, respecting the rule of law, honoring an independent judiciary and separation of powers, demonstrating, demonstrating an incorruptible commitment to freedom of speech and freedom of the press, and reminding people what happens to them individually when those, these freedoms do not exist. Democracy is a word. It embodies those principles. It delivers those things I mentioned. It's the only vehicle to guarantee them. Yeah, democracy is messy and inefficient. Progress is rarely straightforward or without setbacks. When everyone gets a say, when everyone's voice is heard and weighed equally in the public debate, when citizens are empowered to hold their leaders accountable, when no one is above the law, that's when innovation and creativity and new ideas succeed. Folks, in my discussions with Xi Jinping and other leaders around the world, 
I often point out to them that their incredible theft of intellectual property from the United States gives them advantage initially, but undermines an entire nation's ability to have faith and confidence in personally being engaged in innovative ideas. There's a reason why there's not a whole lot that says made in China, invented in China, or any other place in the world. We've learned, if we learned anything in the past years, however, is that we cannot allow complacency to take hold or lull us into a false sense of untouchable superiority. Despite its strength and all the reasons I've spoken about today, democracy is vulnerable. We have to speak out when we're backsliding anywhere in the world, including in our own societies, including mine. And if our leaders cannot or will not do that, for whatever reason, then it falls to us to protect and preserve our most sacred values. That brings me back to where I began, the responsibilities we bear as citizens and the power inherent in that role. Because although one citizen alone may be limited in his or her ability to affect change, even a small group of citizens working together with shared purpose can become a powerful catalyst for action and change in each of our countries. That's why around the world, activists and advocates and everyday citizens wake up and get to work. They sign petitions, they organize protests, they run for office. They share a bone-deep conviction that the world can be better. Democracy is a belief that we can make it better. But none of it happens by chance. I'll close the day with an oft-told story from the earliest days of my nation. It said that Benjamin Franklin, while exiting the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, was accosted by a group of citizens who approached him and asked what kind of government the delegates had decided on. And he responded, a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. Democracy demands diligence. Democracy demands engagement. And sometimes democracy demands sacrifice of its citizens. That's how we keep it. We have to keep fighting the battles that need fighting. Each of us must be willing to step into the breach in our own countries. For my part, I intend to keep speaking out through my work at the Penn Biden Center, the Biden Foundation, the Transatlantic Commission, and any other organization I'm engaged with. I look forward to working with and alongside all of you in this mission to reaffirm our shared democratic values and expose and expand the cause of liberty around the world because an engaged citizenry is the best and most reliable barrier against the erosion of our freedoms. If we don't stand up our for our democratic values and our democratic future, no one else will. And I'll close by saying that we've gone through periods in history before where there have been monumental changes that have taken place technologically and in the economies of the world. Moore's Law, digitalization, artificial intelligence. And it always takes societies somewhere between a half a generation and two generations to catch up. We have our Luddites today who are wandering the middle and smashing the machinery. It's going to take a while to figure out how how these enormous changes, enormous changes, can rise everyone, not just what's happening now, and a few. But that's the work of government. Folks, democracy is all about one simple thing, freedom. 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 We don't use the word very often. They're synonymous. And they do not exist. It does not exist in the liberal democracies. Thank you for listening.